we all know there are seasonal coronaviruses out there and we get infected and they are very common. Now, at any given time, 15% of the population probably has these seasonal coronaviruses. They cause common cold or upper respiratory tract infections. And the question is, if we make immune responses to those viruses, can they protect us from an infection like SARS-CoV-2? Hi, I'm Mindan Palindira. Welcome to Masterclass. I'm going to talk about immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 today. When you have a new infection, it's really hard to try and work out what exactly the immune system does to control the virus. It's very important that we all have an immune system that actually controls the infection quite rapidly. What we really want is the immune system would be very effective in controlling the virus quickly so that the virus is cleared from the system. But sometimes it doesn't happen that way. It seems that the virus can hang around for a little longer. But then it becomes a bit of a problem. We have to look at the balance between how we control the virus and could there be any collateral damage. So let's start from the basics. Let's see who the players are. We've got multiple immune cells in our system. So we've got innate cells, which uh, are the first responders to the infection. Then we have the adoptive cells, so part of the adoptive immune response. So we've got many of these cells. Which are the key players? We still don't know the full picture yet, but let's break it down and try and understand how our immune system can actually help us deal with this virus. So as I said, the innate response is uh, basically our first responders. Uh, and they're there as soon as we get the infection, they get into action, and they do a lot of important things. Sometimes we overlook the innate responses. We think of adoptive responses as the big thing. We talk about antibody responses, but the innate system is also very important because as I said, it's the first responder when it comes to infection. So when you get the virus, uh, for the first two days, it's your innate response that is actually trying its best to control the virus. So as part of this innate response, we have things like uh, interleuc uh, sorry, interferons that actually are, um, uh, are very important in controlling the virus. So one of the interferons, type 1 interferon, comes early on during infection, and it's the best way we can actually alert the cells that are not infected yet that there is something going on. The virus is there, there's an infection going on. And these interferons can also activate a lot of antiviral pathways. So this happens very early on within the first two days of the infection. And that's quite important because how we control the virus early on can be important. Now, interestingly, all these dangerous viruses come from bats. So you might wonder why bats don't get sick. And if you look at the bat's immune system, it actually is very clear. They have an innate response that is constitutively active. So they always have this activated innate response. And they seem to have some low level of type 1 interferons in there. And the theory is that they could be helping the virus to be controlled so although the bats have the virus, but it's probably keeping them under control. So we should not underestimate the need or the power of the innate response when it comes to uh, dealing with viruses. But what we really want in some ways is a good, strong adoptive response that actually clears the virus quite effectively. So if you look at the kinetics of the virus, it's very clear that the activation of the adoptive responses coincides with the clearance of the virus. And um, if we don't clear the virus early, as I said before, uh, it can be a problem because it would then influence the way the immune system actually handles this in the long run. So um, when it comes to the SARS infection, we know some patients, uh, a majority of the patients luckily have mild infection. They are asymptomatic or mild cases, and they seem to be handling it really well. If you look at the viral load in those patients, it's very clear there's a rapid clearance happening. Within the first 10 days, the patients are able to clear the virus. 
But unfortunately, there are some patients who don't seem to clear the virus early and they get really sick and they get hospitalized and uh, some of them even uh, end up at um, uh, ICU. Uh, if you look carefully as to what is happening in those patients, uh, there's something called cytokine storm or cytokine release syndrome is likely to be happening. Now, we still don't understand how this comes about, but the prediction is perhaps not controlling the virus early or there's a dysregulated immune response that is taking place. So what happens is then there is an amplification of the immune response to this virus. So immune cells are getting activated. They are producing these factors and cytokines, interleukins, the interferons, and they're activating each other as a way of communicating um, and it gets amplified. So what happens in cytokine release syndrome is that we are making lots of anti, um, cytokines rapidly within a short period of time. And this can have systemic consequences. It can actually affect all parts of our, our system. It can affect different organs, including your lungs, your heart. So it's believed, I think, the cytokine storm that we are seeing in these patients is a key uh, part of the, the severity of the disease. If you look at the cytokines that are involved early on, we see pro-inflammatory cytokines coming out. So the interleukin-1 and interleukin-6 are quite crucial. Now, the early studies from China seems to suggest that interleukin-6 is consistently up in those who have severe form of COVID disease. So that has prompted uh, clinical trials to try and block interleukin-6 and tocilizumab is one of those antibodies that actually can block the interleukin-6 receptor. And that's currently under clinical trial just to see whether this can actually prevent severe form of the disease. Another problem uh, these patients have is something called ARDS. So this is where their lungs get affected. And if you actually see very um, closely at the pathology of the lungs, it's actually uh, very clear that uh, there are immune infiltrates coming into the lungs, uh, particularly neutrophils and monocytes. And they produce factors uh, that can damage the tissue and that leads to you know, tissue damage and you have uh, um, endothelial cells getting damaged and leak, vascular leak that leads to edema and so forth. And that probably plays a major part in those patients as well. So in the severe form of the disease, perhaps there is an exaggerated uh, immune response that is going on. We still don't understand how this comes about, but that is very clear. So that's why there is talk about trying to re reduce the immune responses through uh, treatment strategies. If we take a step back and look at patients who are managing this well, so those who have mild form of the disease, and try and work out how does the immune system actually handle this virus quite effectively, it's uh, quite clear your adaptive immune responses are also playing a key part in this. Uh, so we have within the adaptive immune system, we have your humoral immune responses where your B cells are making antibodies against the virus. And then you have your cellular immune responses, which actually can effectively kill viral infected cells. So let's focus on the humoral responses to start with. So this is where you have your B cells activating getting activated by the virus, and they are making antibodies that will then go and bind to these viruses. What we expect out of these antibodies is that the antibodies will neutralize the virus. So that particularly if uh, we make the right isotype of antibody, particularly this being a mucosal infection, you would expect IgA antibodies would be crucial. Now these antibodies can, in theory, neutralize the binding of the virus to its receptor. So uh, SARS-CoV-2 binds to ACE2 receptors. So if the antibodies can interfere with those bindings, then you can actually prevent infection, further infection taking place. So that's the strategy here. So if we are measuring antibody responses in patients, it's very important that we actually work out whether they are making neutralizing antibodies. Now, um, are antibodies useful? Yes, we know antibodies are useful for diagnostic purposes, and we are hoping that antibodies can actually prevent infection in some form or the other. The other interesting thing that's coming out of the clinical studies is that um, transferring 
the plasma from a patient who's recovered recently into patients who are having a severe disease seems to improve the patients who are having the severe disease. And perhaps this is working through the antibodies that have been made by those who actually recovered from the um, uh, infection. So early studies with small number of patients uh, are promising. I think that will uh, um, uh, be a good thing to keep an eye out for. There are over 60 clinical trials now looking at this plasma therapy. Hopefully that would be a, a beneficial effect as well. But having said that, we should also start to think whether what exactly the, the antibodies are doing. There are two lines of clinical evidence that point to perhaps not so important role for antibodies. One is that there's no clear correlation between the level of antibodies that we make and the disease severity. So the, China, the studies coming out of China doesn't seem to suggest that if we make more antibodies, we are better protected. The second line of evidence is that there are patients who have a form of immunodeficiency, primary immunodeficiency called X-linked A gamma globulemia. Now these patients, unfortunately, don't have an enzyme that is required for the development of B cells. So there are at least two patients who've got this immunodeficiency, but have been infected by this virus. The interesting thing is that they actually, although they had pneumonia, they recovered from the infection, almost suggesting that perhaps you don't need mature B cells to uh, recover from the disease or to clear the virus. This is something that we need to keep a, uh, an eye out for. That brings me to talk about the other arm of our adaptive system, because we emphasize a lot on antibodies and B cells, but we shouldn't forget that T cells are also very important when it comes to viral infections. So we do know from early studies that people do make good responses to SARS-CoV-2 or good T cell responses to SARS-CoV-2. We make helper T cell responses as well as cytotoxic T cell responses. So the important question now is how protective are these T cell responses? Now, in one study that has come out last week, it's becoming very clear that almost 100% of the patients who recovered from SARS-CoV-2 had T cell responses to uh, the virus. So that actually suggests that T cell responses are playing a part, but we still don't know what exactly they could be doing. Now, when it comes to adaptive immune system, one of the key features of the adaptive immune system is the memory. Now, we expect the T cells and B cells that have encountered the virus to then remember the encounter so that if we get the virus again, they'll protect us very effectively. So when we have populations of memory T cells and B cells hanging around in our system, should we get the infection again, we have a rapid response, better quality of response, better magnitude of response that usually controls the virus very effectively. And this is a memory response that I'm talking about. So the million dollar question is, can people get reinfected with SARS-CoV-2? We've all seen media reports. One patient got infection three times. We heard about the Korean cases where over 110 patients uh, um, had reinfection. But is that really true? The unfortunate thing is we don't have clear scientific evidence. These are all media reports that we are looking at. There's no clear scientific evidence showing that people can get reinfected. I don't think reinfection is likely in this short frame of time. One thing to keep in mind though, is that immunity to coronaviruses in general doesn't seem to last long. So study is actually showing that generally immunity to coronaviruses may last a year or two. So that brings me to this final question. Now, we all know there are seasonal coronaviruses out there and we get infected and they are very common. Now, at any given time, 15% of the population probably has these seasonal coronaviruses. They cause common cold or upper respiratory tract infections. And the question is, if we make immune responses to those viruses, can they protect us from an infection like SARS-CoV-2? So we know majority of the patients who get SARS-CoV-2 do it well. Is it because they've been infected previously with a seasonal coronavirus? We don't know the answer yet, but that's something that we need to keep an eye out for. 
Some studies that are coming out just now are pointing that we do have good responses against those endemic viruses. So you can actually measure antibody responses against those viruses. And in one recent study, uh, they were able to show that T cell responses against endemic viruses could react against SARS-CoV-2 as well. So this is something that we need to look at very carefully to know whether these exposures can actually protect us. Perhaps that's what's making those uh, majority of those patients uh, uh, handle this virus really well.